So we're measuring in hands. Are we going to start throwing around weights in stone as well? I mean, I don't see why if, not. Because if we do, I'm going to be lost real quick. I'm just saying, horse people, and I'm a horse people myself, horse people measure their horses in hands. Now, whose hand is it? Warning, the following show will spoil the hell out of George R.R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire books and the TV show A Game of Thrones. Also, you're probably going to find a fuck ton of bad language. The explicit tag is there for a reason. Death and boobies, 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 death and boobies. Welcome back to the Ironwood Network Book Club. I am your host, Maester Ironwood, and with me today to break down the prologue of A Game of Thrones is Widow Wolfsbane. Widow, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. How's it going, Mr. Maester? I am doing fantastic. I'm really looking forward to breaking down this prologue, getting into it, seeing what's happening. It's really one of my favorite openings to... A story. It's uh, it jumps right into some kind of crazy shit that uh, is a little insane, a little intense, and sets up a really good story. I think that I'm kind of dying to see the end of. I I completely agree. So I this is the first time I have been reading the books through. Um, so I mean they've been around since 1996, from what I can tell, reading through the the publication history, and. Reading through this for the first time, I had to read the chapter twice to be able to pick up on a lot of the information and a lot of the uh, the literary devices that George R. R. Martin throws down at us. And, I mean, we all know he's a fantastic author, but it's it's a fantastic prologue of even any of the many book re- series that I've I've gotten into. Absolutely, and this is my second read-through of the books, and I've read bits and pieces of them more times than that. So I think it'll be an interesting contrast with you going through for the first time and seeing all the things that surprised the hell out of me the first time through. And oh, yeah. I, th- I think that that'll be interesting for the listeners getting the uh, the breakdown from somebody who's already read through everything and somebody who's just going through it for the first time. Now, you have watched the TV show, I assume, all of it. I have. I have watched the TV show. I've seen a lot of the episodes probably at least three to four times each. So I'm very well aware of like the, the in-depth history of the TV show and the character developments there and the devices that they use for like the TV watchers of the world. But um, I'm also the avid reader and I also love the whole idea of being able to see what George R. R. George R. R. Martin wanted for the series without having to cater to the TV audience because everyone who's a book reader knows the TV audience and the book audience are not the same group of people. Yeah, the the, the book audience is a very small subset of the TV audience. Yes. Like 1%, if that, because the show, no matter how bad it continues to get in its later seasons, just has a massive, massive audience, so... That's that's pretty interesting, yeah. And you can just call him George. I don't think we need to say George R. R. Martin every single time. That's going to get annoying. That's pretty true. Going to get annoying for you to say every time, I think. I think we all know who you mean when you say George in relation to these books. I I could probably call him the Great One, and we probably still all kind of know who we're talking about. (laughs) Ooh, I don't know about the Great One. That's Wayne Gretzky. I'm going to have have to take a pass on that. All right, that's that's fair. That's fair. I I can concede to that one. All right, so you put together a short synopsis of the prologue. You kind of kind of walk us through exactly what happens before we dive into it and break it down. So why don't you go ahead and get us started? All right, so the prologue starts off north of the wall, where our lovely friends the wildlings tend to hang out. Um, but no one's really in the prologue except for the first main three characters, who are Garrod, who is a senior member of the wall. He's been on the wall for 40 years. Um, his young friend, Will, who's only been there for about four years, who's not really given a specific age, but is somewhere like estimated into his twenties, give or take. And then there's Sir Waymore Royce and Sir Waymore Royce is only 18 years old. And he's also the commander of this three man group that's out North of the wall. Um, and they have been sent out by 
uh, Commander Mormont down at Castle Black to investigate a group of um, wild folk that are hanging out above the wall to see why they're there, to see why they're so close to the wall, and come back with some information to find out what's going on. Um, unfortunately, that tends to go a little awry toward the middle of the chapter when Will tells them that he found the encampment, but all of the men there, there's about eight to nine full-grown men, a couple women, and no children. And they're all just kind of laying there as they had fallen. And Will was very insistent upon the fact that they had fallen, not that they had fallen asleep, but they had fallen in a sense of battle. And so he goes through that, and Waymore wants him to really, like, you know, show him, like, no, I need to see what you're talking about in this sense. Bring me to this battlefield and show me what's going on here, because you're saying there's no blood, but all these people are dead. And... Garrett's trying to inform them, or Waymar, sorry, excuse me, Waymar is informing them that there's no way that these people froze to death because the wall is weeping. It's not cold enough for them to freeze to death because the wall itself is not frozen solid. It actually has a nice shimmer of melting ice coming down the side of it because it's too warm for anybody to freeze to death. And then as we get to the end of the prologue, um, it gets colder and the wind comes in and the wind brings with it a group of people that George has referred to as the Others. And these Others are very, very strange people, very white and translucent. They blend in with their environment almost perfectly. And even for Will, who is an avid hunter, is having a hard time being able to distinguish them from the environment that they are in. And it takes a couple of lives toward the end here. Get rid of uh, Sir Waymore, his 18-year-old high horse fellow we have. And unfortunately, it looks like at the end here, we also, we also lose our friend Will to Sir Waymore, who has since been dead. So he's dead, and then he kills Will. Yes. So we've got zombies showing up. Yeah, we're in, getting a... In the first chapter of the book. I like it. I like yeah, where we're going. We've, we've, we've already got the zombies there. I mean, it literally, it does. It says in here that... Will sees Sir Waymore fall, and then he goes down there, pick up his sword to bring back proof to the castle that this has happened, this event happened, and here's a, a shattered great sword to show you what happened here. And then Waymore, with a beautiful piece of steel in his one eye and his other eye nice and piercing blue at this point, turns around and very gently caresses Will's face and then just kind of chokes him. Okay, so great discussion there on the prologue. A nice little rundown of what happens. Now, I know you took copious notes and have several things that you want to go over regarding events and questions and things that took place during the prologue. So let's go ahead and get started on that. All right, I would just like to mention, too, for fun information for all of our, our listeners out there, my only, only... Um, grievance is that I didn't have another color pen to do this color coded. So everyone bear with me on my, my notes here. Oh dear Lord, no color coding. How <laughs> will we ever survive? Oh, you know, we're going to trudge along like, like good little, little people of the night's watch. All right. So my first thing when I was going through this, my first, um, I can't think of the word. But my, my, the first thing I was looking through when I was going through this chapter was that I wanted to know the exact ages, more or less, within about a couple years of the three characters in the prologue. Because they put a lot of information in there based on these characters of why they have such a problem with Royce being their commander and why Garrett's not the commander of this little outpost. Um... And, I mean, it's, they make it fairly obvious as to why Will is not, because he's, he's a younger man himself. But then we find out that, that Royce is actually years younger than Will himself and is only 18. So he's 18 years old. I mean, he was knighted before he was a member of the Night's Watch. He was part of a very large, very powerful family that had too many heirs, and they couldn't afford to marry all of them off. So poor Royce got set up to... Uh, the Night's Watch to kind of ease their burden. And then there's Garrett, and Garrett is in his 50s. He's been with the Night's Watch for 40 years. He's been he's been through the, the the north, he's been through the castle. Like he knows the Night's Watch by like the back of his hand. 
nothing surprises him anymore. And even he going through this prologue is just, he's on edge about everything the whole time. And Sir Royce is just kind of poking fun at him because he wants to know why this guy who's been out here so many times is, you know, so scared about being out on this, this excursion particularly. Yeah. Waymar seems to have a, a very big case of the, uh, confidence of youth shall we say i would i would indeed say that he is just he's balls blazing he's ready to get this done he wants to impress mormont back at castle black so he could just you know have all the glory for himself even though yeah some somebody's definitely making a bid for like first ranger yes or uh you know uh, leadership of a bigger ranging party than just uh, him and two other guys i would agree he's uh obviously coming from a rich and powerful family even being the fifth son he's used to people giving him deference obviously people respecting him and his opinion regardless of whether it's right or wrong because as they say in monty python how do you tell who's in charge the one with the cleanest clothes that's so true. and and he has fantastic clothes in in this prologue where they describe his his supple his supple leather gloves and his beautiful castle forged mail his gorgeous sable cloak yes yes absolutely i mean he's he's apparently better dressed than anybody else in the night's watch including the lord commander Yes, it looks like Daddy made sure he was going to be quite comfortable up uh, up on the wall yes. for his excursions up there. And so much so that when Garrett shows that he's lost both of his ears, um, a couple of his toes, and a finger or two to frostbite, he looks Garrett dead in the face and says, maybe you should just dress warmer then. And Garrett just basically looks at him with the look of, I will fucking kill you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> his poor, his poor drizzier. If I believe that's how you pronounce the word, um, which is a, a large war style horse is mentioned in the thing. It is a war horse. Um, think of something like a draft cross or like a, a Frisian, if you know what a Frisian looks like. And that's basically what he's riding. He's riding a giant clunky horse that is meant to frighten your enemies when you go stomping through the battlegrounds. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a horse you want to use in a stealth situation where you're kind of like being quiet and sneaking up on people that you're trying to take by surprise. Absolutely not. And he's got, so he's like, it never really mentions the color of the horse. Um, oh no, it does. It does right here. Mounted on his huge black destrier is, so he's got, he's basically got a giant black horse in a frozen winter landscape. He is completely decked out in black. He's got a giant black horse. He is standing out like a sore thumb in the winter environment for every single um, other and every single wild folk person to be able to see him from a mile off. Well, in his defense, they all wear black only. Yeah, but he didn't need a black horse because poor Will's horse, his small Garen, is a small, little bit larger than what you would call a pony, so a little bit taller than 14 hands. Uh, he's got like a, a more muted color horse that actually matches the environment that he's in. So we're measuring in hands. Are we going to start throwing around weights in stone as well? I mean, I don't see why if, not. Because if we do, I'm going to be lost real quick. I'm just saying, horse people, and I'm a horse people myself, horse people measure their horses in hands. Now, and whose hand is it? It's just an odd form of measurement, frankly. Um, it has a conversion chart of how many inches it comes out to be. So I am a five foot six person, and in horse world, I am about 16 hands, give or take. It's a strange measurement. It doesn't really, you know, have much founding as far as standard measurements go, but it was just a way that they used to measure horses. They would literally take someone's hand and put it on the horses and then measure up that way. And then that phrase just kind of stuck. So, so the person who came up with this is basically like the guy in his bachelor apartment who doesn't have a tape measure trying to figure out if a piece of furniture is going to fit where he wants it to go. Yes. Just kind yes. of like, oh, it's about yay yeah. big. Yeah, they, they, I, my, my estimate and my, my guess of this whole situation is that back in, you know, those olden days before they really had a standard of measure, they would, they would use their hands to like measure stuff like, you know, so, so far, so wide kind of thing. So they would take their hands and they would just measure up the side of the horse and be like, he's 14 hands tall. So one person's 14 hands is probably going to be a little bit shorter than another person's 14 hands. It has since been, um, modified to have a standard 
among the horse community. And did they find somebody cool who had, like, the perfect sized hands to make as the standard? I really hope so. I really hope it's something, someone, like, really cool, like, um, I don't know, Elrond, because Elrond's a fantastic horse master in a different world. Okay, I know who you're talking about now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I would, I would go with something along those lines. At first I thought she was talking about L. Ron Hubbard. Nope, nope, L. Ron. <laughs> and then I was like, no, L- wait, no, L. L- Ron Elrond the Elf. <laughs> L. Ron of Rivendell. Okay, so we learn that uh, Waymar Rice really uh, doesn't really know what's going on. I and mean, he seems to think he does. He seems to a, be very confident, but... Uh, I have a vague feeling that he might be compensating for um, some some setbacks in his life, not quite related to his family, more so related to his general physical statures and limitations. So you're you're throwing out the small penis argument I, against Waymar right, at the, right the at the beginning. The man just died. Bat. The man just died. Have you no respect? I have plenty of respect, but not for a guy that has no respect for his, his crew. Mm. Especially his more experienced crew. Exactly. I mean, even the younger of his crew has, what, 200 missions north of the wall in his four years? Yes. Yeah. So I can just imagine how many missions above the wall the other one has. If in four years you've got 200 missions, I mean, the other guy must be like in the thousands. Oh, probably more point. like the tens of thousands, at least. I mean, he's been on the wall for 40 years, and he's never been... He's never been out of sorts being above the wall before, and then out of nowhere, this one mission with this one brand new guy who has something to prove, everything just kind of falls apart. Well, yeah, and that's another thing is that uh, not just was he scared, but these two have survived hundreds of times above the wall. The first time they go out with Waymar Royce in the lead, and they're dead. Yep. It, it, all, it all points down to the fact that Waymar is just... Just not the dude to try to lead somebody. Not yet. He's not a leader yet. He he still has a lot more grooming to do that his his daddy did not pay for. Well, he's uh he's not gonna get it. Because <laughs> he's, he's well, I mean, he is walking around, so maybe as he got up, he he, maybe, he brushed it off. Yeah, maybe Zombie Waymar uh, will become a, a fantastic leader in the other's army. Who knows? That that could very well be true. I mean, he doesn't need both eyes to be able to you know kill some other people, Absolutely. as we can see. Yeah, I, I've I've always been fascinated by Waymar Rice, and I have, I still have questions that uh, I can give the questions here, but I don't really want to get too much into the answers because a we don't really have them yet, and b speculation on them uh, is kind of spoilery for later things that happen in the books. But I just wonder why Waymar Rice. I mean, yes, he's the fifth son of the Rice household, but as far as I know, the Royce household is plenty rich, has plenty of vassal houses, and more than enough opportunity for the fifth son to marry, you know, the lady of something or other, and still have a pretty good life. Maybe Daddy got tired of his big riches attitude and decided that he needed to go toward the wall. That could be. But... I mean, he very obviously shows that off through this whole prologue. That he's just, you know, he's the best, he's got all this stuff, he's got all the money. I mean, he's got no money now. He's got the title still. Well, I bet you he probably still has. I mean, I think the guys at the wall could have money. How else are they paying for hookers back at, you know, Molestown? That's, that's fairly so true, too. So, they could probably have some money. Well, hopefully Daddy's imagine. giving him some pretty good uh, compensation checks monthly. Yeah, some, you, well, some... yeah, you forced me to take the... Go take the black. I better get something in return yeah, for right? it. Yeah, right. Better get some alimony checks of some you sort. Know, like my brothers get the castle and I get the wall. That's kind of drawing the shit end of the stick there. They they get the castle in the veil and he gets the castle. He gets castle black on the wall. Yeah, falling apart castle black. Yep. In, as part of the falling apart Night's Watch, I love it. One thing I do love about his character in this is that very quickly we learn that the Night's Watch is really not what it used to be. It's kind of like this little decrepit you know, shadow of its former self. And yes. Waymar Royce in this prologue kind of goes from like the grandiose beginning of the Night's Watch, this, you know, valor filled knights defending the world of men from dangers beyond the wall to this at the end of the prologue, he's his clothes are tattered and torn and his eye is gone and he's dead and he just kind of like mirrors the rise and fall of the Night's Watch. 
Don't forget all his right in the prologue. Close. Yeah, all in the prologue. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Nice little bit of symbolism showing, uh, you know, the fall of the Night's Watch through a single character. I find it very interesting that uh, that George was able to do that. I I agree because and and it's not really the only time that he used quite a bit of symbolism, especially when um, in in regard to the others that they mentioned the entire time it wasn't cold enough for these these wild folk to have died from freezing to death, but there was no other form of death that they could deem suitable for having no bloodshed anywhere around, and that these people just kind of fell in their place. Mm-hmm. And so, but then when they talk about it, and I'll pull up. Um, a little bit of a quote here that Will turned away wordless. There was no use to argue. The wind was moving. It cut right through him. And in that part right there, it hadn't been windy until that point right there. And then literally three paragraphs later, the others made no sound. And the the others brought the wind with them. Mm-hmm. So it is very, very possible that these wild folk had frozen to death solely because the others themselves are the cold. They are the embodiment of fr- of frozen and ice and winter. And they brought that coldness with them. Um, and it wasn't until that the, the others showed up that the wind sort of dissipated. Because as they moved in, the wind moved in. And then once they were there, the wind stopped. Mm-hmm. So, and that right there too... Um, we'll go back to our good old friends, the Starks, that we'll be, you know, coming very well acquainted with in the next couple chapters, and their house words of winter is coming, and the cold is coming, winter is coming, and the others are the cold. Mm-hmm. I love it, and I love, there's one line in here that I absolutely love, because we know the whole series of books is A Song of Ice and Fire. Yes. It's a duality or difference between ice and fire. I have a feeling it's more of a duality than the differences between the two, especially considering the line in this prologue that says nothing burns like the cold. Yes. Nothing burns like the cold. Showing that it's equal to probably just the other side of the coin of fire. Yes, exactly. Because you you can get like wind burn people talk about that all the time that they go when people climb up Everest they come down and their face is completely red and chapped and everything and it's not always frostbite it's wind burn yeah by the way those guys are crazy motherfuckers I've seen the (laughs) I've seen the shows on Discovery Channel crazy motherfuckers I I agree I would never pay somebody ten thousand dollars to make me climb up a mountain of which I cannot breathe yeah so (laughs) I mean it's a probably got a fantastic view but you know what else is a fantastic view Google Earth yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go to some other places. I'll climb Count, Mount Mount Kilimanjaro, but I'm not going to be climbing Mount Everest anytime soon. Yeah, give me a nice easy one. Well, yeah, and yeah, and then I mean, just to get onto the mountain, you got to go through that Kumbu Icefall thing, yes. which is that place that has like you know 50 foot wide, 75 mile deep chasms of ice yes. that you have to climb over. It's like you know what? You know, what? think I'll fucking pass. The wall is Mount Everest. That's what it is. The wall is Mount Everest, because Mount Everest has those those 50-foot chasms. The wall has those, too. The wall's got all those chasms and all those, like, pieces everywhere that you fall off the wall. Gone. Dead. No yeah, more. yeah. A 700-foot-tall wall. I don't know as though I really want to be climbing atop this wall. I don't know that I would even want to be using Ev. If you watch, um, if you have seen the show, they show you the little ladder that takes you up the side of the wall in the very opening scenes, mm-hmm. like not even in the show itself, but just like the intro. I would not even want to get on that. I wouldn't trust that to bring me up there, especially if everything's freezing. Right. Everything's going to stop. What happens if you get stuck, you know, 500 feet up? You're 200 feet away from the top. I'm not climbing that. You're 500 feet away from the bottom. Still not climbing that down. Like, what do you do at that point? You're just, you just, you lay down and you go to sleep and you hope that you don't die until someone fixes the problem. <laughs> you lay down in your bed and you cry. <laughs> You hope the Lord Commander takes care of shit. You, you, you go to fetal <laughs> position and you just you you just sit in the fetal position and you pray that you're back in your mother's womb and that everything just starts over. <laughs> yeah, or you will. You just hide up in your tree, watch your commander you're, fight the others one you know single combat without telling him without that there telling are, there's more like, coming. Yeah, that there's there's more behind him standing there watching him die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, and that's if that's an interesting point is that we do learn that there's some sort of like social structure to the others in the fact that the 
other ones who come around allow the first one to fight him in single combat. Yes. And they only yes. close in and attack after he's already lost and is basically dead anyway. Yes, so he, yeah, Waymar had been struck down, and he was on the ground, he was trying to stagger himself back up to standing, and then that's when they all kind of closed in on right. him and killed him. And But they but they did, they just stand there, they, they kind of made it the fight circle, Yep. and they just, they, I mean, they weren't going to let him turn and run. Right. But they were in no way going to interfere with this, the main other doing his job to take this guy out first. Yeah. They were all like, listen, you can have your fight. We're gonna we're just gonna stand here. We're we're the ring guards. You don't get to go anywhere. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting piece about some sort of society that they possibly have is that they allowed their for I guess lack of a better word, their champion to fight him. Yes, and it does mention combat. too that they do have some form of language that is unknown to Will too. Yeah. So they do have some form of, and it sounds like the, crackling like ice, ice, crackling ice, on like on a on a Which river. Is really yeah. interesting, crackling so, ice. And I like I personally can't kind of fathom what that would sound like on my own. Say like I know what crackling ice sounds like, but to try to imagine that coming out of what used to be a person. Yep. Is just something that I'm just like, it's kind of beyond my reach. Now, are we certain, I don't think we're certain even today that the others are formerly people. This is true. They're, it does not. I mean, well, the best description we get of them, and I love that we get this description of them, because again, there's the whole, there's dualities throughout the whole story. And one of them that we'll come to later is um, the, the opposites, black and white. Yes. They run into black and white doors on a number of occasions, things like that, black and white trees. Mm -hmm. And in the prologue here, the, the others are described as shadows. This one time as white shadows mm -hmm. and one time as black shadows. Yes. Which I find an interesting tie to the doors that are one black, one white, or the different trees that are one black, one white. Yes. And, and that's possibility and, of a future reveal for things to come, hopefully. Yep. And see, and I get I get my assumption that they used to be people only simply from that Waymar rose and started to look like one of them with the, the ice blue eye yep. and the pale skin. But that does not necessarily mean that these others really were people first. Yeah, I've always so, thought that possibly... They were either people before or um, children of the forest. Yes. Yes. There's another that possibility simple, of things that they could be. You know, the duality of the children of the forest where there's there's probably, there. I mean, there's there's duality of everything in this book. So there's got to be the duality of like, these could be children of the forest that are like, you know, like basically reapers. So then you would imagine that there's got to be the opposites that like, you know, nurture life as opposed to try to take it. Yeah, I completely agree. Sir Mouthy, leave my feet alone. Sir Mouthy has decided that he's going to be Sir Pawsey for a little while. And yeah. Paw at people. I was stepping on his bread tie. Oh, how rude of you, sir. I know. How my rude of you, Sir fault. Ironwood. Rude. My fault. I believe <laughs> Sir Mouthy deserves an apology. I am sorry, Sir Mouthy. Thank you. He feels much better now. <laughs> All right. And then, so, one of the other, the other things that I would like to pick up in this book... Um, is some foreshadowing that I think is like a key part of this of this um, prologue, um, which I hope to see again. You know, after the the new book comes out, and see if maybe this ties in a little bit. You know, six books from now, is that um, Garrod wanted to make a fire after they were about to get to the campsite where where the or the wild ones had had fallen and Will had saw them dead. Mm -hmm. And Waymar told him, no, you're not making a fire. Like, that. there's no fire. That's because and Waymar knows best. Waymar does know New best. New TV show, Waymar knows best. Way <laughs> it'll, it'll be a top seller, and everything's <laughs> going to, of course, go the exact opposite of how he plans. <laughs> um, but in this part, um, there is, there is a, a quote that Garrett says that says, there are some enemies fire will keep away, bears, direwolves, and other things. And... Then Sir Waymar is like, you're not making a fire. End of story. I've got, you know, the biggest horse in this conversation. So that's what I, that's what's happening. And Garrett, of course, concedes because he has to listen to the person who's been given, you know, head rank of the command here. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, 
And the very specific part of this is that it keep, will keep away other things and then the others come because Garrett has not been allowed to make a fire. Yep. So. Whole problem could have been avoided. If Garrett made a fire. If we could have made a fire. Yep. Whole problem could have been avoided oh. if Sir Waymar had any more common sense than the fact that it's cold, let's make a fire. Yeah. Yeah, he just... Base camp. Base camp gets a fire. Yeah, he's just... He's got the... His... His... He's... He's too arrogant, right? I mean, he's confident, yes. but he's way beyond confident he, into cocky and arrogant. I would I would use the word hubris in the situation. Oh, absolutely. He's got so much hubris that he literally brings his own downfall upon himself because he can't be beaten. And the downfall of his men. And the, yes, and the downfall of his men because because he can't be beaten, he can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. And then the exact thing that would have saved him that he said no to done. And then, not even that, but then he sees these, like, mythical monsters that nobody's seen in thousands of years. And instead of, like, telling, like, yelling to Will, run, get a message to somebody, or trying to run himself to get a message to somebody, he pulls out his sword and decides, yes. I'm going to fight this thing in, in single sword-to-sword -sword combat because, obviously, I can't be beaten. I'm Sir I, Waymar Royce. I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm Sir Waymar Royce. I can't die. I am. I am. I am. But a man. But I am immortal in my own sense of mind. Yeah. I mean, just and it it's stunning to me, and I th it's hilarious because I think he at this point in the story, I think he's serving as a a interesting introduction to the character of Jon Snow, who we'll get to, because when Jon gets to the Night's yes. Watch first. He is very arrogant he is. about how much better he is than everybody else yes. who's there. Because he had a similar upbringing of being castle trained. Yeah, you castle know, he was trained. trained by Sir Roderick. Yep. So he, had he literally all the training. just he yeah. was the best fighter. He was he was the best. He wanted to be a ranger because that's he was that was what he was going to be good at. Mm -hmm. And he when he got picked for the be position that he had to be a steward. He was just like, nope, this is impossible. I'm too good to be a steward. Yep. Like I can't handle this. Absolutely. So, yeah. and it sounds like Sir Sir Raymore had, or Waymore, excuse me, Sir Waymore had the same idea where he just wanted to be a ranger and he made sure daddy got him his ranger status within the six months that he's been at Castle Black. Yep. So. Yeah, I, I, I could see uh, Big Papa Royce being like, you know, maybe like formerly friends with Sir Alistair. Oh, yeah. He's, who he's, chooses who becomes who yeah. at the Night's Watch and being like... Yeah, I told your dad I'd make you a ranger, so of course you're going to yep. be a ranger. He's, I mean, he's rolling on his Rolls Royce, which is probably in this day and age a, a you know, a giant nice black horse. Yeah, well, not even a, <laughs> like yeah, it's like a it's like a bunch of Frisians or something like that. He's got like six Frisians pulling him in like a, a gold and silver plated like little carriage here, and he's just chilling out in the back. He's got his own driver and everything. I, I'm just imagining the uh, the the horse drawn thing from. Neverending Story 2. Yes. <laughs> with, yes. like, Bastion in the back and, like, just, like, wasting everybody's memories and shit just by being a goofball and looking at dumb shit and doing dumb things. I mean, that's just what I'm imagining when you're talking yeah. about Royce riding up to the Night's Watch and something like that. I don't yes. know why, but that movie popped in my head. But, yeah, I, I do love the parallels between early Jon Snow and Waymar Royce and the fact that Jon Snow lives long enough to, to be able to see the error of his ways and right. his arrogance. To become, Indeed. yeah, his, his arrogance to become confidence and mm -hmm. him be able to use that in positive ways. Absolutely. Until he dies. Awesome. Spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. Little, little past that part, but you know. I put spoiler alert to the beginning of all the episodes. Just, That's fair. Just to be nice. That's fair. And I put, ex or, uh, yeah, I put uh, expletive warnings. As well, oh, just in case. Well, sweet shit for that. Yeah, so that way, in case you want to say fucking shit, you can go ahead. They've already been warned. Yeah, if you if you start reporting us because we say balls and shit and ass and stuff like that, like just, just I will don't. clearly point to the red E next to our podcast name. Yes, in the iTunes list that list. literally says, you know, don't be a pussy ass bitch. Yeah, that's what that that's what that red E stands for. So. We don't have to go around offending everybody on purpose. Just saying. Well, I mean, 
But I'm with you on that. If, yeah. you, if you put on a podcast that says it's got explicit language, and then you get offended by explicit language, bite me. This is true. Because, <laughs> I mean, this, this, first, this first prologue is not... I mean, I haven't. Dro- I mean, I I'm definitely a person to drop a lot of f bombs. We're gonna put that out there now. Whittles Wolfbane is gonna be dropping some major f bombs later in the story if it goes anything close to how season one of the TV show goes. So I'm putting that out there. But at the same time, what the fuck happened to Ned? Exactly. What the fuck happened with Cersei and her brother? Well, shit. No. Well, there are some changes. Between some some significant changes. Between the books and the TV show. I will say I that so. as we go forward. But I hope so, because then that keeps the book fresh and its own separate entity, which makes it that much better to read. Yes, there are some significant changes between the two storylines, no doubt. Good. I'm yeah. looking forward to that, though. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, and he's looking forward to the shit that I write down, because I'm like, well, that didn't happen in my memory. <laughs> All right, what do you got next for us? So the next thing I've got is a a juicy piece of poetic irony on Sir Waymore Rice's behalf over here. So let me just pull up. I do like some poetry and I do like some irony. I I love a good thing of irony. Irony is delicious. And especially when it's. When all you need is a knife. I mean. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So he's. So um, let me find my place around here. And I will show you the best thing. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So this is at the part where we are at the the old battlefield. There is still a giant double-bladed battle axe laying on the ground, but all of the, the dead bodies are gone. So they're at the campsite. Yeah, kind of a shock. He, right? Will's like, yeah, all the bodies are just laying there. And Waymar Royce is like, I don't believe you. You're obviously dumb and old and stupid. And so I'm going to need to see these for myself because I just don't trust you. Exactly. And then they get there, and as far as we know up until this point, Waymore Rice is right, and the bodies are gone. Yes. But then we get the, yeah, they're not going to leave behind a really awesome battle axe. This is true. So, yeah, so they've got this double-laded battle axe still laying there. It's untouched. It's a very valuable weapon. So Sir Waymore wants him... To get up, you know, don't hide here. There's nobody around. Why are you laying on your belly like a like a yellow belly coward? Like a pussy. Why are you doing yep. that? Yeah. So Will gets up and Sir Waymar, and here's here's where the quote starts. Sir Waymar looked over him with open disapproval. I am not going back to Castle Black a failure on my first ranging. We will find these men. He glanced around, up the tree, be quick about it, and look for a fire. Because he I'm I'm saying he's looking for a fire for two points. One, he wants to see if Garrett listened to him. And he wants to know if Garrett made a fire. I never, ever, in like the 27 times I read this prologue, yeah. did I even think yep. that he wanted to make sure Garrett didn't make a fire. I like that reading. Yes. So, yeah. So, I saw that. And it was my second time through when I was like reading through it like a little bit more delicately the second time. Hmm. Um, I sit in there like, I mean, of course he wants to see if these wildling people have moved along. Right. Yeah, and they made a fire someplace off in the distance where he might be able to see some smoke. But I think he also wants to make sure that he's being taken seriously and (laughs) that Garrett's listening to him. And Garrett didn't make a fire himself either. I like it. Because if he finds out that Garrett made a fire, there's going to be some shit going down for Garrett at that point. Even though he's, you know, 40 years his senior. Yeah. So I have that there. But so the... To continue forward, though, with the beautiful piece of poetic irony is that um, he is not going back to Castle Black a failure on his first ranging. And if we go another page and a half or two page and a half over and Sir Waymore is no longer a living, breathing person, he's not going back to Castle Black at all. At least. Maybe. Yeah, at least not. Maybe eventually he'll get there. I mean, it's not in our foreseeable future, (laughs) I would say. So, I mean, he's not going back to Castle Black a failure, because at this point, he's not going back to Castle Black alive. Absolutely. So, I thought that was a, a beautiful, juicy piece of thing. Oh, and then he also said that he will find these men. He was so adamant about finding these wild folk that Will and Garrett so desperately saw just laying there dead, and that he had to be 100% sure that these people were dead. And, I mean, it doesn't necessarily say that the others that came through are the people that he found dead, but who's to say that they're not? Right. So he may have very well found the people that he was looking for, 
And he's not going back to Castle Black. Yep. A failure. Look at that. Will did know what he was talking about after all. He did. He was very, he's very true to his word, this guy. Very He was nice. brought up to be an honorable man, and he kept his word on that factor. I do like that he did face his end like a true knight. He stood there with his sword in hand and told the other, so let's dance. Yes. And fought him with chivalry, trying to defend himself and his men. I do appreciate that. And I think Will I even, have to admire that also. Will even says right there at that moment from up in the tree, he says, no longer a child, he is now a man of the Night's Watch. Of course, then immediately he's cut down and dies. I mean, he was only really a man of the Night's Watch for maybe about 30 seconds to a minute. Because, I mean, yeah. you think of these battles and while you're fighting somebody, I mean, I've done some combat stuff myself, usually like through MMA fighting or through like, you know, some sticks in the backyard and you're just knocking each other's knuckles bloody. Um, it feels like 15 to 20 minutes that you're sitting there, you're like you're fighting against this person because the adrenaline rush is so intense. Yep. And Will probably has a hell of an adrenaline rush going up in that tree. But, I mean, from an outside perspective, Garrett's probably sitting over by that fire that he made that Will never saw. And he's just sitting there like, well, son of a bitch, why the fuck haven't these people come back yet? It's only It's been 20 minutes. Like, that or he just got the fire made. And he's like, you know, it takes him 10, 15 minutes just to get the, the fire started. Fire has been brewing for about 20 seconds. And then he just kind of realized, oh, shit, everybody's dead. Now, okay, so now you think not only did Royce want Gar or Will to look for whether or not Garrett made a fire, but you think Garrett actually did make a fire. I'm going, I think Garrett made a fire. And then solely. Will saw it and was like, nope, no fire up here. Not, I, yeah. I don't, nope, he definitely didn't make one. I, I would literally, I would bet some money on that. I would probably gonna put a good 50 piece on that because... Frankly, a gold, one, a gold dragon. A gold. I would put a gold dragon on this because these two guys do not like way more. Oh yeah, all. I mean, they, like they yeah. hate him. They they, hate they him. call him my lord, like yeah. out of jest. Like, yes, they're like, oh sure, my lord, whatever you say, my lord. Exactly. Which is what they do. Which is what Alistair does to John when he calls him Lord Snow. Yes. Even though he's a bastard, which I think is hilarious. Exactly. But he calls him Lord Snow. Yeah. yeah. So they think, they're always picking on Royce, calling him. My lord, yeah. yeah, and they flat out refer to him as Lord Ling because he's not old enough to actually be a lord yet, right? Yep. So yeah, so the, I think that even though Garrett acquiesced and said, "All right, no fire," and Royce took it, Royce took it for acquiescence and turned away. I think that he took it as the acquiescence, but as soon as you know Royce's back is turned and he's not close enough to see that there's a fire going. That Garrett's like, you know what, fuck this shit. I don't like bears. I don't like direwolves. I don't like other shit that's probably out here somewhere. I'm making a motherfucking fire. Right. <laughs> I am I am protecting my ass. And if Will gets back over here, I'm protecting Will's ass too. Okay, fuck that other guy. Okay, so okay, so let's assume that that's right. And then let's assume that Waymar Rice does not get killed. When he makes it back to Garrett with the fire, what happens? I think that... Had the others not come and Waymar makes it back and he sees that Garrett's got a fire, I honestly think that he would just kind of sit there and stare at the fire and then stare at Garrett and then just kind of think of a ways that he could get him in trouble, but then end up not doing anything because the guy's got so much more experience on him. You don't and think he kills him for not following orders? I don't think he can. I don't think that he has the experience in fighting to be able to take down a guy who's been doing rangings for 40 years. I think that he would try. I, I honestly think he would try. I think he would probably challenge him to the duel, but I think that he would find himself defeated because Garrett is just a, probably a, at this point after fighting the, the, the free folk for so long and the wildlings and everything that I think that Garrett's just a better fighter. Interesting. Huh. I like it. Yeah. And I think that he probably fights dirtier I would, yeah. Than Waymar. Yeah. Like, Waymar's, Waymar's got, got sword honor. in hand. I bet you that Garrett pulls out knives and goes, like, Sir Bron of the Blackwater on him. Oh, hell yeah. And just goes, like, oh, yeah. dirty knife fighting style. Garrett's in this to win. He's in this to survive. He's mm -hmm. been here. He's a 50-year-old dude. He's been here. He's been back. He's here to keep going and keep going back. And to, like, to keep, you know, all the women and children south of the wall safe. Ray, or Royce is just there because he wants the glory and everything. So he's he wants to fight for glory, and fighting for glory means having to fight with honor. 
So yes. he's not going to pull out a knife somewhere and, you know, get Garrett in the kidney. He's going to, you know, fight with just his great sword and just go that way. And then he's going to end up losing because he's fighting for, for, for his dignity and for his honor. And Garrett's fighting to get rid of this guy and then go back and tell Mormont, hey, uh, sorry about your friend there, but kind of got killed by some wildlings. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. Maybe, like, you know, cut up his own face a little bit, give Will a scratch or two, and just be like, listen, this makes it more realistic, and now Look, we never Will, I gotta take again. your hand off. They'll never believe the wildlings almost got us off. We don't take your hand off. Exactly. I know I know you came to the wall to keep your hand from, from poaching in the forest, yep. but I hate to break it to you. Now, now you gotta give that hand up. <laughs> Sorry, dude. You've had it for Too four funny. years longer than you needed. <laughs> I love your headcanon on this. This is fantastic. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yep. Listen, I I'm not an in the box type deal, so there's going to be some random things that people, some some people may have thought of these things, but I mean the the average Joe is yeah. not is not going anywhere near these thought processes. I never assumed that a Garrett built a fire or b that Royce had Will look to see if Garrett had built a fire. Yeah, I just kind of like left that part of the story behind as soon as it was done. That's yep. well, too funny. So part of that comes to also, so when they first get to the to the scene, they talk about how there's a fire pit where the wildlings were, but it was very obvious that they had not made a fire. Yep. So they had the intention of having a fire, but they hadn't done anything with it yet. Yep, not yet. So why, if it's the middle of the night, why would they still, like, you know, if they had moved on and they left all of their stuff there, why would these people who left... Why would they have a fire going? If they're running for it and they left all their shit there, they're not going to stop in the middle of the night to make a fire. They're going to keep pushing. They're they're mm -hmm. familiar with this territory. They're not going to stop. Yep. So he wants to know if he's been being listened to because he's only 18. I love it. I think you're, you know, and I think you're probably absolutely correct. I bet you that he did want Will to look to see if Garrett had built a fire. I like it. Never thought of it, but I think you're totally right on that. But that's absolutely part of the equation. Oh yeah, that was that was one of the things that just kind of popped in my mind. I'm like, look at that little shit thinking that Garrett's not listening to him, who should not be listening to him because <laughs> it would save his motherfucking life right now. <laughs> All right. Out there. What else do we have to go over? Oh, my other thing too is that the the allegiance to Robert Baratheon, even though Robert himself has not come into the the show yet he's not part of well the show the the show being the book in this case he's not part of like this book at this point he has not been introduced yet aside from the fact that when the others come and he's about to start fighting he yells for robert for king and country yep he is all of, even though he's on the wall and he's he's been more or less abandoned by his like even though he keeps his last name of wilmer royce like, they don't have last names for the most part, from my understanding of the wall. Like, you leave your family and you well, leave your future you, behind. You don't get any of the, like, you can't, like, hold the lands yeah. or the titles. But, I mean, Benjamin Stark is still Benjamin Stark, and everybody knows Benjamin Stark is a Stark. I think they use those, I, my theory of that is that they use the names as, like, reference kind of stuff. So then that way, if you have two mm. people from two different places that happen, like, there's, I mean, I'm sure there's more than one brand in the world. Right. So, but, like, but there's not a Bran Stark, and, or there's not a Bran Stark from, like, you know, Winterfell and a Bran Stark from King's Landing. Right, but the, I get the, f well, there's only one Stark family. Well, yeah, but, but you know, there's not two people but, with the same last name. There's only one less. Royce family. Yeah. But I get the feeling because you think of Waymar Royce. He doesn't get to be a ranger leading a ranging party on his own without the last name Royce. So yes, he's supposed. You know, yes, they're supposed to leave the name behind, but mm -hmm. it still helps. Benjamin Stark is first ranger. I mean, I don't know as though Benjamin Snow becomes first ranger. That's true. Being that they, they weren't going to let John and, Snow. And really, the only reason John Snow is chosen to be like the you know, aside from being well trained, but to be first steward to George or Jor Mormont is because. They all know his father. Yes. They all know his uncle. Yep. They know that he's a Stark. So, again, with the names playing out, and we learn, that, we'll, we will learn later on that the Mormonts, Lord Commander Jor Mormont, 
I mean, he was the lord of Bear Island, another, you know, famous, powerful house from the north. So you've got all these people with powerful names that are the people in the positions of power in the Night's Watch. So obviously they're not just getting rid of the names. I mean, they they obviously mean a lot. Yeah. When they go up there, they're they're still keeping their names. I mean, they're not keeping their titles so much because right. They I mean they they still move them around yeah. and they still get to have different things. But yeah, I, I think that their names and their families still play a big part of it. Minus Maester Eamon, he does not like to have. But his, that's because he purposely yeah. gave away. He didn't he, want yeah, anybody he, he to know he's a Targaryen. Yeah, he wanted nothing to do with anyone knowing who he was yeah. because he didn't want everyone to realize that he was the Mad King's older brother. Just a couple more things to go over real quick. Um, is there any kind of comparisons or differences between what happened here in the prologue and the part of the prologue that was covered on the show that you want to discuss? So, yeah. So, my biggest my biggest um, grievance, I would have to say, is at the beginning of the show... Oh, no. She's airing grievances. Grievances. Ruh-roh. Someone's in trouble. <laughs> so... My biggest grievance is that at the beginning of the show, as anyone who has seen the show has seen, it's a it's a younger guy, blonde hair, that gets beheaded by the good sir Ned Stark. Um, he's not, the, a, not, he's a, not sir. a sir. That's he's, true. He's not a sir. The good man Ned Stark. He's known. He's he's no knight. He's that's true. Unfortunately, he should have been a knight. He's he a lord. A, he was a great guy. But yeah, so the good lord Ned Stark beheads a a young blonde haired guy that from this prologue we would say is Will. But at the end of this prologue, it is very clear that Will is um, brought to his demise by Royce. So, but in the show, they, his name is also Garrett. So my big concern between this prologue here and the prologue of the show is that they have changed Will and Garrett, um, their characters, and changed their ages to better suit what was going to be happening in the show. Because... No one's going to believe the credibility of, like, you know, and from what the way that the kid looked in the show, a 15-year-old, 20-year-old kid. Going about, crazy, yeah. spouting off nonsense. Yeah, spouting off nonsense of the others on the, of the other side of the wall, seeing these people come back from the dead, blah, blah, blah. No one's going to believe a kid who just joined the Night's Watch, who's, you know, still wetting his bed at night because... You know, he sh- he doesn't want to be dealing with this lifestyle. Wow, you got a pretty low view of Will slash Garrett. Jeez. I do in the show because they make him out to be a terrible person. <laughs> so, but yeah, and that's the big thing. And then here, as you read this prologue of the book, he's he's a, a seasoned, like, ranger in the very beginning. Like, it does say that he's been on the wall for four years. And the first time he set, was sent beyond, he got so scared he gave himself diarrhea. But since then, he's never had a problem until this run, and he's had he's had a veteran of hundreds of rangings by now. So he's you know, as we stated before, he's got at least a good hundred to two hundred like you know outings over the wall under his belt. Yep. And so there's there's no reason for people to not believe him of what he's seeing. Right. And other than the fact that he's a deserter and who believes a deserter. Right. But they give him the age of Royce. With the name of Garrod, with the skills of Will, into like the same one person in the prologue of the show. Yep. And then just kind of, you know, cut him off at the shoulders there. Yep. I think other than that, though, the port, the part of the show, the cold open that they did, that is kind of the prologue. I think they did a pretty decent job. I mean, there's differences like the bodies of the wildlings are hacked into pieces and arranged into some there's definitely crazy some shape. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely different. I think um, it's more visually impactful than yes. I think they could have done with just sticking to the strict prologue from the book. I feel like if they had stuck to the prologue of the book, it would have been about like 15 to 20 minutes longer of a prologue introduction of the show. Right. But it still would not have had the same impact as, as what they did for the yep. show. And as we know, um, people who read are a little bit more intense and more giving of time it takes to build up yep. than show watchers. If show watchers are not interested within the first 10 to 15 minutes, they're done oh, with the show yeah. already. Yeah, if you've, got an, if you've got a cold opening and you have to put exposition in your cold opening, mm-hmm. people are not watching beyond your cold opening. That first commercial hits and they're gone. Yes, absolutely. So I completely understand why they did the cold opening the way they did. Plus that little girl with the blue eyes jumping around. Oh, yeah. Freaky as fuck. 
Absolutely. That's... Creepy kids in movies and TV shows scare the living shit out of me ever the since Shining. I was a kid. The Shining, yes. Oh, those two little girls. Yes. Urgh. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the cold opening definitely hit me emotionally when I first saw it. It was intense. So It was. And, I mean, frankly, I, I did not really even know that the books were around the first time that I watched the first episode. Ooh, I found out about... Hardy Fall. Yes, I know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm jumping into the game late, but I'm still jumping in the game. And I did, like, so I would have done the same thing, though. Like, if it had been just, like, a, like if I had seen this opening, like, word for word, more or less, as a scripted show... I would be a lot less interested to find out what happened for the rest of that show. I'd get into this and I'd be like, why are you like a bunch of assholes sitting around a fire complaining about who's dead and who's not dead? Like Actually, Sitting around not a fire. That's true. Sitting around not a fire. <laughs> or the fire that Garrett built later. You know, he, he built that fire. I know it. Yeah, um... Actually, you talk about... I mean, I knew when I first started watching the show that the books existed. But I had never read them. Because spoiler Party alert to yourself. anybody, spoiler alert to anybody who is listening to this, uh, Maester Ironwood is not a huge fan of the fantasy genre at all. He's not. He's very much a historical person of factual history and the like. I, but I'm also a big sci-fi fan. For instance, I love Orson Scott Card, one of my favorite sci-fi authors. However, I can only read half of his stuff. I read the sci-fi stuff and I absolutely love it. But I've That's tried bad. on his fantasy, and and see, and I'm a, I can't. <laughs> I'm a I'm a huge component of straight up fantasy and sci fi. Like I mean, I like sci fi, but I prefer a healthy dose of fantasy because my my version of of reading and being like immersed in another world is getting away from the reality of this world. And we can do that in sci fi. And we yes, I'm 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 the person who walks into a bookstore and gets pissed in my mind that there is a section called sci fi and fantasy. Because they are two completely separate genres. They are genres. two completely separate genres. And I, I mean, shame on some of the bigger bigger companies that had them stuck together like that. I mean, yeah. they could very well have an aisle for each one or an aisle or two for each one. Because yeah, now I've got to look for sci-fi mixed in with fantasy. Yes. And there's almost always more fantasy. So I'm looking for, you know, one book inside of ten. You're looking for like two needles and a big case stack. Yeah. So I, I get annoyed by that. Amazon does it too. They have sci-fi and fantasy as a category on their site, and that annoys me as well. Yes. Goodreads does it to me. I mean, it's pretty much everybody does it. I think, personally, they should be separated. Um, but, yeah. Well, I mean, this is all coming from stores that have the Bible in both the historical section and the non... Or, like, the fiction and non-fiction section. That's true. So, I mean, let's, let's we'll put that straight out there. Yeah. Also, Pew what Stephen King... Other? Huge Stephen King fan. Only books of Stephen King's I have never read are the Dark Tower series. Oh, and that his sci-fi stuff. Yeah, his yeah, his or his up his fantasy, fantasy stuff. Yeah, his and I, fantasy. That's the only books of his I've never read. I've read everything else he's ever written. Mm -hmm. I haven't read those. Uh, I have read the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and the Silmarillion. I enjoy that. But, yes, but most other fantasy I just I can't get See, into it. But yeah, I I've. I've become very, like, just in the first, this prologue is only nine pages, and I've become very fond of this writing style and this book so far. And I, I mean, but I am a, a total fantasy nerd. I will state that outright dragons galore, you know, knights of old time and things like that are very much my alley. So this is already, you know, knowing the, the show, this is already like a book series that if I had known about this series before the show... I would have jumped on this in a heartbeat. I watched the first two or three seasons of the show, and I tried reading the books one time. Just couldn't do it. So it's so long. It's so his writing style is so different, and I just forced myself finally to read the first book, and I fell in love with it, and started breaking it down and looking at things and. It's just such an in-depth world that I almost approach it like I would a historical topic when just I'm reading these. a historical topic of another, of another world. Right. Yeah. Because you get so much of the, like, backstory with missing pieces mm -hmm. from a certain person's perspective. But it's almost like reading first source history. Yes. Which 
I did in college and love to do. So I, I think taking that approach to the books kind of helped me really get into them, treating them more of that way than any other way. Let's see. I don't think we have anything more to cover, but I guess that's going to pull the uh, the coverage here. And we will join you again next time uh, when we cover Chapter 1 of A Game of Thrones, Brand 1. Thank you for tuning in.